theCUBE's live coverage is made possible by funding from Dell Technologies. Creating technologies that drive human progress. Welcome back to the FIDA in Barcelona. You're watching theCUBE's coverage, day two of MWC 23. Check out siliconangle.com for all the news. John Furrier's in our Palo Alto studio, breaking that down. But we're here live, Dave Vellante, Dave Nicholson, and Lisa Martin. We're really excited. We're going to talk Qubits. Vanessa Diaz is here. She's CEO of Lux Aquanta. And Antonio Asin is a professor of ICFO. Folks, welcome to theCUBE. We're going to talk quantum. Really excited about that. Thank you guys for... What, what does quantum have to do with the network? Tell us. Right, so we are actually living the second quantum revolution. So the first one actually uh, happened quite a few years ago. It enabled very much uh, the communications that we have today. So in this second quantum revolution, if in the first one we learn about some very basic properties of quantum physics, now our scientific community is able to actually work with the systems and ask them to do things. So quantum technologies mean right now three main pillars, no areas of exploration. The first one is quantum computing. Everybody knows about that. Antonio knows a lot about that too, so he can explain further. And it's about um, computers that now can do wonders. So the, the, the ability of, of these computers to compute is amazing, so they will be able to do amazing things. The other pillar is uh, quantum communications, that in fact is slightly older than quantum computing. Nobody knows that and we are the ones that are coming to actually counteract the superpowers of quantum computers. And last but not least, uh, quantum sensing. That's the, the application of, again, quantum physics to measure things that were impossible to measure in, with such level of quality, no, or precision, and before. So that's very much where we are right now. Okay, so I, I, I think I missed the first wave of quantum computing, <laughs> right? Because, okay, but my our understanding is, you know, ones and zeros, they can be both, and the qubits aren't that stable, et cetera. But, but where are we today, Antonio, in terms of actually being able to apply quantum computing? I'm inferring from what Vanessa said that we've actually already applied it, but has it been more educational or is there actual work going on with quantum? Well, at the moment, I mean, typical question is like uh, whether we have a quantum computer or not. I think uh, we do have some quantum computers, some machines that are able to deal with these quantum bits. But of course, this first generation of quantum computers, they have noise, they're imperfect, they don't have many qubits. So we have to understand what we can do with these quantum computers today. Okay, this is science, but also technology, working together to solve relevant problems. So at this moment, it's not clear what we can do with present quantum computers, but we also know what we can do with a perfect quantum computer without noise, with many quantum bits, with many qubits, okay? And for instance, then we can solve problems that are out of reach for our classical computers. So the typical example is the problem of factorization that is very connected to what Vanessa does in, uh, in her company. So we have identified problems that can be more efficient, solved more efficiently with a quantum computer. Okay, with a very good quantum computer. People are working to have this uh, very good quantum computer. At the moment we have some imperfect quantum computers. We have to understand what we can do with these imperfect machines. Okay, so for the first wave was, okay, we have it working for a little while. All right, so we can, we can see the potential. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and we have enough evidence, almost like a little experiment. Okay, so that's, and now it's apply it to actually do some real work, right? Yeah, so now uh, there is interest by companies, so because they see a potential there. So they are investing and we, they are working together with scientists. We have to identify use cases, problems of relevance for all of us. And then once you identify a problem where a quantum computer can help, you try to solve it with existing machines and see if you can get an advantage, okay? So now the community is really obsessed with getting a quantum advantage, okay? So we really hope that we will get a quantum uh, advantage. Okay. okay, this we know we will get it if we eventually have a very good quantum computer, okay? But we want to have it now. And we're working on that. We have some results that were, there were some, uh, say, I would say a bit academic uh, situation in which a quantum advantage was proven, but to be honest with you, on a really practical problem, this has not happened yet, okay? But I believe the day that this happens, then it, I mean, it will be really a, a, a game changing. So you mentioned the word efficiency, mm -hmm. and you talked about the quantum advantage. Is the quantum advantage a qualitative advantage in that it is fundamentally different, or is it simply a question of greater efficiency, so therefore a quantitative yes. advantage. The example in the world we're used to, think about a card system 
where you're writing information on a card and putting it into a filing cabinet, and then you want to retrieve it. Well, the information's all there, you can retrieve it. Computer system accelerates that process. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not doing something that is fundamentally different unless you accept that the speed with which these things can be done gives it a separate quality. So how would you characterize that quantum versus non-quantum? Is it, is it just so much horsepower it changes the game or is it fundamentally different? Okay, so from a fundamental perspective, quantum physics is qualitatively different from classical physics. I mean, this year, the Nobel Prize was given to three experimentalists who made experiments that proved that quantum physics is qualitatively different from classical physics. This is established. I mean, there have been experiments <coughs> proving that. Now, when we discuss about quantum computation, it's more a quantitative difference. So we have problems that you can solve with your classical, <coughs> in principle, you can solve for the classical computers, but maybe the amount of time you need to solve them is, we are talking about centuries. And not with your laptop, even with a classical supercomputer, these machines that are huge, where you have a building full of computers, there are some problems for which uh, classical computers take centuries to solve them. So you can say that it's quantitative, but in practice you may even say that it's, quite, it's impossible in practice, mm. and it will remain impossible, okay? And now these problems become feasible with a quantum computer. So it's quantitative, but almost qualitative, I would say. Uh, before we get into the problems, because I want to understand some of those examples, but Vanessa, so, your role at, at Lux Quanta is you're applying quantum in the communication sector for security purposes, correct? Correct. Because everybody talks about how quantum's going to ruin our lives in terms of taking all our passwords and figuring everything out. But, but can quantum help us yes. you know, defend against quantum? And is that what you do? That's what we do. So one of the um, things that uh, Antonio is explaining, no? so a quantum computer will be able to solve in a reasonable amount of time something that today is impossible to solve unless it takes, uh, you leave a laptop or a, well, a supercomputer working for years. So one of those things is cryptography. So at the end when you send a message and you want to preserve its confidentiality, what you do is you destroy it, but following certain rules, which means you're using some kind of key, and therefore you can send it through a public uh, network, which is the case for uh, every communication that we have, we go through the internet, and then the receiver is going to be able to reassemble it because they have that private key that nobody else has. So that private key is actually made of uh, computational problems or mathematical problems that are very, very hard. We're talking about 40 years time for a supercomputer today to be able to hack it. However, we do not have the guarantee that there is already a very smart mind that already have potentially, you know, the capacity also of a quantum computer, even with uh, enough, uh, no millions, but maybe just a few qubits, enough to actually hack this cryptography. And there is also the fear that somebody could actually waiting for quantum computing to finally reach out this amazing capacity. We harvesting now, which means capturing all this confidential information, storage in it, so when we are ready to have the, the power to unlock it, and hack it, and, and see what's behind. So we're talking about information as delicate as uh, governmental, um, citizens' information related to health, for example, you name it. So what we do is we build a key to encrypt the information, but it's not relying on a mathematical problem, it's relying on the laws of quantum physics. So I'm going to have a channel that uh, I'm going to pump um, photons there, light, particles of light, and that quantum channel, because of the laws of physics, is going to allow to detect somebody trying to sneak in and seeing the key that I'm establishing. If that happens, I will not create a key. If it's clean and nobody was there, I'll give you a super key that nobody today or in the future, regardless of the computational power, we'll be able to hack. So it's like zero, super zero trust. Super <laughs> zero trust, so, I like that. Okay, so, but, but, so <laughs> quantum can, can solve really challenging mathematical problems. If you had a quantum computer, could you be a Bitcoin billionaire? <laughs> uh, not that I know, I, I think people are, okay, now you move me a bit of my comfort zone, okay? Because I know people are working on that. I don't, I don't think there is a lot of progress, at least not that I am aware of, okay? But, I mean, in principle, you have to understand that our society is based on uh, information and computation, okay? Computers are a key element in our society, and if you have a machine that computes better, but much better than our existing machines, this gives you an advantage for many things. I mean, progress is locked by many computational problems we cannot solve. We can want to have better materials, better, medicines, better drugs, I mean, this, you have to solve uh, hard computational problems. If you have a machine that gives you an, uh, machine learning, uh, big data, 
I mean, if you have a machine that gives you an advantage there, this this may be a, a really a real change. I'm not saying that we know how to do these things with a quantum computer, okay? But if we understand how this machine that has been proven more powerful in some context can be adapted to some other context, I mean, having a much better computing machine this is an advantage. When? When are we going to have it? You said, we don't really have it today, we want it today. Are we five years away, 10 years away? Who's working on this? There are already quantum computers out there. It's just that the, the capacity that they have right now is the order of a few hundred qubits. So people are, there are already companies harvesting. They're actually, the companies that make these computers, they are already putting them, uh, people can access to them through the cloud and they can actually uh, run certain algorithms that have been tailor made or translated to the language of a quantum computer to see how that performs there. So some people are already working with them. There is billions of investment across the world being put on different flavors of uh, technologies that can reach to that uh, quantum supremacy that we're talking about. The question though that you're asking is Q-Day. It sounds like doomsday, you know, Q-Day. So depending on who you talk yeah, to, well, they will give you a different uh, estimation. So some people say, well, 2030, for example, but uh, perhaps we could even think that it, it could be a more aggressive day, maybe 2027. So it is yet to uh, be defined, let's say, you know, that hard deadline. But I think that uh, the risk, you know, the, that it can actually bring is uh, big enough for us to pay attention to this and start preparing for it. So at the end, in terms of cryptography, that's what Luxpanta is doing is we have a system here that can actually uh, prevent all your communications from being hacked. So if you think also about Q-Day and you go all the way back, so whatever tools you need to protect yourself from it, you need to, you need to deploy them, you need to see how they fit in your organization, evaluate the benefits, learn about it, so that how long, how close in time does that bring us? Because I believe that the time to start thinking about this is now. And, and, and it's likely it'll be some type of hybrid that will get us there, hybrid between ex existing applications, because you have to rewrite or write new applications, and that's going to take some time. But, you, but it sounds like you feel like this decade we will see Q-Day. What, what, what probability would you give that? Is it better than 50-50 that, but by 2030 we'll see Q-Day? Well, I'm optimistic uh, by nature, so yes, I think it's uh, much higher than 50. Like how yeah. much I would you, would you think? 80, it's, I would say, yes. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm pretty confident. I mean, but what I want to say also, usually when, I think there is a message here, so, you have your laptop, okay? In the past, I had a Spectrum. I don't know if you, this is a very small <laughs> computer. It was more or less the same size, but this machine is much more powerful. Why? Because we put information on smaller scales. So we always put information in smaller and smaller scales. This is why here you have, for the same size, you have much more information because you put on smaller scales, okay? So if you go small and small and small, you find the quantum world. So this is unavoidable. So our information devices are going to meet the quantum world and I'm, they are going to exploit it. I'm fully convinced about this. For, maybe not for the quantum computer we're imagining now, but they will find it and they will use quantum effects and also for cryptography. For me, this is unavoidable. And, and you, you brought the point, there are several companies working on that. I mean, you know, I can get quantum computers on the, in the cloud and Amazon and other suppliers. IBM, of course, is... is yeah. The know, underlying kind of technology stuff. is not, is, there are competing versions of how you yeah. actually create these qubits. Yeah. Spins of electrons and all sorts of different yeah, things. It's, it's Does it need open. to be super cooled or not? There we go. Uh, you know, we're very, you know, at, at a fundamental stage, we're to, we're to be getting ground. But what does what does Chat GPT look like uh, when 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 it can leverage the quantum well, realm? Oh. Well, okay. This I is mean, are we, all, are we all out of jobs at that point? Should we all just be no. planning for? No, I well, not you. No, I, 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 yeah, I think I think all of us. Uh, <laughs> real estate in Portugal. Should we all be looking? No, actually, <laughs> one of the things, I mean, uh, in machine learning, there are some hopes about quantum computation because usually you have to deal with lots of data. And we know that in quantum physics, you have a concept that is called superposition. So we, there are some hopes, nothing concrete yet, but we have some hopes that these superpositions may allow you to explore this big data in a more efficient way. One has, to see, one has to see if this uh, can be confirmed, okay? But one of the hopes creating these lots of qubits in these superpositions is that you will have better uh, uh, artificial intelligence machines. But Okay, this is quite uh, science fiction, what I'm saying now, okay? It's just, at, the, uh, at this point, and, and when, you, when you say superposition, that's in contrast to the ones and zeros that we're used to. Yeah, so when someone says it could be a one or a zero, or a one and a zero, yes. that's referencing the concept of superposition. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And so, so if, if this is great for encryption, mm -hmm. 
doesn't that necessarily mean that bad actors can leverage it in a way that is totally. now unhackable? I mean, our technology is, uh, again, it's impossible to hack because uh, it's the laws of physics that are allowing me to detect an intruder. So that's the beauty of it. It's not something that you're going to have to replace in the future because there will be a triple quantum computer, you know? It's not going to it's not gonna affect us in any way. But um, definitely the more capacity, computational capacity that we see out there, in quantum computers in particular, but in any other technologies in, in general. I mean, when we were coming to talk to you guys, uh, Antonio and I, he was the one saying, we do not know whether somebody has reached some relevant computational power already with the technologies that we have, and they've been able to hack already current cryptography, and then they're not telling us. So it's a bit of a, the, the message is a little bit like a paranoid message, but if you think about security, the, the amount of millions that that means for a private institution, no? when there is a data breach, we see it every day, and also the amount of information that is relevant for the well-being of a country, can you really put a, a, a reasonable amount of paranoia to that, you know? Because I, I believe that it's worth exploring whatever tool is going to prevent you from putting any of those pieces of information at risk. Super interesting topic, guys. I know you got to run. Thanks for stopping by theCUBE. It was great Thank to you have guys. you on. Thank you very much. All Thank right, so this is the SiliconANGLE CUBE's coverage of Mobile World Congress, MWC Now 23. We're live at the FIRA. Check out siliconangle.com and thecube.net for all the videos. We're right back, right after this short break. Thank you.